You're Patrick Bateman. I am. You are Peter Michaels. For today? Yeah, for maybe, today. Maybe tomorrow. Um, I'm, ex- I, I'm, I'm excited. Sorry. No, I'm, I'm really excited, too. I've been listening to the shit out of this record all week, and it's I'm really loving it. Like, the term banger gets used way too much. But yeah. it is, like, it's... It's a banger. Like yeah, it rocks. It was, there's one song. It's the second track on this record, which is called The Cost of Doing Business. And the song is called Hot Damn. Hot Damn. And uh, I damn near drove off the which road at about 20 seconds into that song. It isn't quite the album opener, but would have no. made a great album opener. Yeah. It's pretty good. It's Yeah. It's, it's Anyways, pretty damn good. We're, we're waiting for uh, Graham Wright from uh, Tokyo Police Club to hop on the line. We're recording this uh, mid December. Mm-hmm. I'm wearing shorts still. Yeah, which is fantastic. I, maybe a little worrisome, but fantastic. Yeah, you like to stretch, stretch that quite a bit. Which I will do anyways in December, but it's nice when I don't have to really think about it. I'm like, should I wear shorts? It's not even a thought. I think you weren't wearing shorts the other day. I saw you on Wednesday night at the uh, the old hockey game. You weren't wearing shorts yeah. then, were you? Going to be in a rink for a couple hours. You yeah, should that's probably fair. That's fair. bundle up a Actually, little. Actually, okay, so I, uh, I w- had the opportunity the other night to drive past your house. <laughs> and I've known you for seven or eight years now. I think seven years. Yeah. Um, and I've never seen your house before. What? Yeah. I said that to no. you once a while back. You were like, what? You've never been over? I'm like, no, 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 never. Huh, but I, I saw your house at like 10 o'clock at night, and it's December. And like we talked about last week, you go pretty hard on the Christmas decorations. So I made a comment to, to the person I was dropping off at your house about the projector lights. Yeah. And those have started to pop up all over the place lately, right? Yeah. And I had made a comment um, about how I kind of think it's cheating a little bit. Oh, 100%. So are the inflatables. Okay, I never thought about that. But anyway, so we get to your house, and I become aware that you have one of these projector lights. <laughs> and I just want to make it clear, I don't think it's cheating when you've already done the work on right. top of if that. If you are solely relying yeah. on if you're just those sticking, projector lights. You're just sticking that one light on the front <laughs> yes. of the driveway that's just doing, like, little sparkly dots Green on Green and red dots, yes. To me, that's cheating. 100%. I fully agree. In your case, definitely not cheating. It, it's it's an addition to yes a billion. It's not quite Griswold. I don't think it was, was it? Was no, it quite, no, it's no, not no. Quite Griswold? No, okay. I don't think so. No, it was good. It was your yeah. Your house looks great. It's tacky. I don't know. Like, what do you prefer? Like, like, like a clean look of like all matching lights and because we're hodgepodge. We've we've got collections from you know my family, her family. I don't. It's all over the place. I'm not that precious about it. Good. I also don't like. We were driving around my neighborhood last night looking at some of the lights and. My girlfriend really likes the Christmas lights. I don't care. I really don't. Yeah. I. It's. Do it's, you have a tree up? No. Okay. No. Will you? I don't think we'll do one this year because, okay. well, this is another thing. Um, I've got, I realized today it's two weeks until Christmas. I had no idea that it was so soon. And I'm flying out of the province on Christmas morning. So, yeah, there's no time for a tree. <laughs> wow. No time for a tree. But we are just about to hop on a call. So what do, what do we got? We got some friends joining us today. We've got some friends, like these friends. Yes, these friends. Sawback Brewing Company. Ghost Services, Inc. Tourism, Red Deer. And Bo's Bar and Stage. It's been a busy week for them. We'll talk about that after oh, our yes. chat. Speaking of putting up Christmas displays. Yeah, Woo. holy hell. All right, uh, let's, uh, let's speak with Graham Wright. Record. All right, whoever has to line them up, that's, that's what I got. <laughs> Is there another name for that game? Crokinole? I That's, I've never heard another name. No, right? it's always been. What is is it like? Do we know the origin of the word? Not even a little. You guys talk a big it, game, but you don't actually know. <laughs> I just like to it, flick the di- flick the disc. I mean, it's, not, it's it? an old Ontario thing, you know. Yeah, it's probably stolen from some you know First Nations language. One one assumes. Fair enough. Fair enough. It's how we generally roll here. Uh, but yeah, it's I just grew up like my family, my mom's family. Who are like old Ontario like farm people? Yeah, Lo- that was like the most fun thing that they were permitted by the church to engage in <laughs> was like cribbage or crokinole. And cribbage, cribbage is hard. I was just gonna say of. if you had to pick one or the other, cribbage or crokinole, which oh, crokinole in a walk. Okay. I don't know how to play cribbage. Dave was playing a lot of cribbage on tour. Really? And I was like, how do you keep track of all this? Dave's a real card game guy, though. His brain has a lot of capacity for that stuff. It's like math to me. I can't do it. I can play war. 
Do you guys have like the extent of my cards? Does he have like a little travel board that some of the other guys in the van? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Wow. Wow. I was uh, I was catching up on the recent episodes of Curb Your Enthusiasm this past weekend, and I was so happy that they made a pickleball joke. Because have you played pickleball, Graham? No. What is is it? No one knows. No one knows. I think I do. I think it's just poorly named. And once you describe it, I'm going to be like, oh, pickleball. But everyone, like, I swear in the last two, three years, like, 75% of the people I know are like, yeah, pickleball is awesome. Do you know a lot of 75-year-olds? No. That's what I'm what? saying. What's like, pickleball? It, it's like an all-ages uh, explosion. Yeah, I know I've heard people talk about it, but, it, like, it's a tennis squash kind of hybrid think, I think thing? it's, like, really calm tennis. Okay. Oh, that sounds nice. Yeah. I think maybe the I mean, ball is like one of those just like plastic balls filled with holes. So it just like floats. A wiffle ball. Uh, like a wiffle is ball. Is that actually? That's, yeah. So yeah, that's yeah. what is it's that actually. The, the sport is actually called wiffle ball, but somebody misheard wiffle and said pickleball. Yeah, let's play. <laughs> and it just stuck. But it seems to no, have gotten wiffle so big. ball is baseball. Right. Yeah. In, Re- in Red Deer, they built. We have an actual pickleball. pickleball facility. Yeah. And just hosted like the pickleball national championships or something a few months ago. That's wonderful. So yeah, start working on your game, and then we'll get you out to the pickleball <laughs> court next time you're through Red Deer. Are you at Bose right now? No, we are okay. at an extension of Bose. Ah, but we do have a piece of Bose that, like, the table that. That's we're using. what I wondered. Yeah, I was like, that table looks table. like Bose, but the wall doesn't. Yeah, we actually we knew that this is the same table that you sat at last time you were at Bose, and we we had them bring it in. You to... go back and forth for every different artist that you have. On. Totally, totally. <laughs> yeah, we we've, we've stuff, been keeping track of your tables for for the last six years now, seven uh, years. The attention to detail is noted and appreciated. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, actually, about a year ago. Um, uh, someone that you've probably interacted with at Bose, Ryan, who runs sound there, um, him and his creative partner, Riley, our producers of this podcast, opened up mm-hmm. this this studio, Communal Creative Studios. Oh, cool. And um, yeah, it's kind of where we're, you know, talking to lovely folks like yourself that tend to uh, enjoy a time or two at Bose here and there. Oh, yes. Mm-hmm. I don't know anyone who wouldn't enjoy a time or two at Bose. What a perfect venue. Yeah, it was nice because we talked to Dave... Two months ago, maybe not even. Um, and it's so funny. We always notice in his like Instagram <laughs> stories, he's often wearing a Bose hat. Yeah, it's a great hat. Yeah, he loves that hat. He loves that hat. You not much of a hat guy? Well, yeah, I'm not. During the pandemic, I let my hair grow. Oh. And so when it hit a certain length, I found that suddenly the hat scene was really working for me, and I started rocking hats a lot. Okay. But since I cut it, I'm kind of back on the – I have a giant box. You know, you're as like an adult male, you have to really try to not just end up with like 30 baseball caps by the time you're 34. <laughs> so I got a ton of them, but I, I wear them very seldom. I feel like I've missed out on a decade of, of good hat game. I could, I could I share. I can't wear a baseball hat. <laughs> necessarily with my you don't have any leaf hats no i don't just toques eh yeah pretty yeah. much just toques so what was the reason yeah. for the for the hair chop off oh the intention was always just to have it be a pandemic thing it didn't look good um <laughs> i my but my plan was i was like i always i wanted to grow it out one more time it was long when i was in high school you know yeah. and i felt i wanted to do it before i was 30 but as i don't know if you remember this from when you were when the last time your hair was short but there's always a point when between short and long yeah it looks awful yeah and i could never get past that point because i'd be like i'm going like there's gonna be girls at this party i can't go with my hair like this yeah and so then when we were all locked inside indefinitely i was like okay this is the perfect opportunity i will let my hair grow long and then i'll bleach it another thing i always wanted to do but was never allowed to do when i was young and then yeah. it was never appropriate and then i'll bleach it that'll be funny for like a month and a half and then i'll cut it and that'll be the end of the and that's basically, I mean, it wasn't the end of the pandemic, but that's basically what <laughs> did I did. you bleach it? Yeah. Oh, oh yeah. How, I, how, I, how I had like long bleached, like pero- not peroxide, but whatever they use. Damn. Uh, I was rocking it. And then when I cut it, I had like frosted tips for a while. Oh, and yeah. I secretly <laughs> genuinely loved the frosted tips. I thought it would be funny, but then I was like, this looks really good. I might do this again. <laughs> um, did you write music when your hair was bleached? I must have. I'm always writing music. Yeah, but did like did it feel different? No, I wish I could have played shows. I think I would have felt different on stage. <laughs> but uh but it didn't didn't come to pass. Honestly, 
The thing is, I always think I look cool, and then I see a picture of us playing, and I'm, you know, I'm sweaty, and I'm, I'm like, my mouth is open singing. Yeah. And I'm, I look terrible. I'm not very photogenic, so I'm kind of glad that I never had to see myself through that lens. I, I'm sad I missed it. Do, I they, say. do these pictures exist online anywhere if somebody wanted to search them out? I think I, there's pictures on my Instagram. I okay. tracked my okay. hair journey you um, know, as a hair influencer. I, I am curious. How was tour? It was great, man. It was just, I've been saying to people, it was just a really great tour. It didn't feel like a, a different kind of tour. It wasn't like good for COVID. Yeah. And it wasn't like miraculously a new level that I never knew existed because we were back. But just in the world of tours, it was a blast. Everyone was feeling good. People were happy to be there. I mean, like people in the van. Yeah. You know, you don't always get all six people like vibing on the same frequency. Mm -hmm. But it felt like we really were. The fans were, you know, obviously people are, are super excited to be back out. And then add to that that it was this anniversary tour. It was really because we were saying in Canada we're on the radio and we have like minor hits. Yeah. And so you play a show in you know, in Red Deer or even more so like in Calgary, you know, places where we've been on the radio a lot. And you have casual fans, people that come out because they know, you know, four or five of your songs. And they're like, oh, yeah, it's a Friday night. I'll go see Tokyo Police Club. That's fun. Yeah. I love that song. And obviously some of those shows, particularly at Bose, are, are always great. You know, it's fun to play to a big, giant crowd and feel like you're rock stars a bit. But there's also something that's really a totally different, rewarding energy to playing to like 300 people every one of whom is a diehard, full-on, knows every song yeah. fan, is like yeah. requesting B-sides and stuff. And it took us a long time to work out that we're an indie band in the States, but ever since we figured that out and started to steer into it a bit, uh, it's, it's been incredibly rewarding. You, so you know that going into those shows, that that's the kind of vibe you can expect? I mean, if you'd asked me, I would have said that, but I think that I was still surprised by it right. every time it happened, you know, because it's also the kind of thing you never take it for granted. Yeah. The show is going to be good. You never go, especially I'm, I'm pretty, that's one of my neuroses, I think, is that every night I'm like, oh, this is going to be the one where there's 44 people there and they're all kind of bummed. It's going to be like one of my bad dreams where just no one comes to the show. No, I, I, uh, I admire that uh, dedication to uh, the refusal to be disappointed. Uh, yeah, I think that's what it is. I think that's just Canadian superstition yeah. is like constantly. And you don't want to jinx it by having high expectations. You don't want like God to hear you making good plans. Yeah. So it's I mean, it's it's silly. Ultimately, I should know by now that it's pretty reliable. But oh, well, well, it sounds like a great time. And you, you had no bro for a significant number of those dates, right? It was just the last four. Oh, was it? Oh, OK, OK. But that was the whole the whole tour was split up enough that we only had bands for four or five dates at a time. So right, it, right. I wish it had been longer, really. Like so amazing, said the but. whale had joined in for oh. a few of those. Yeah, said the whale were on five, I think. Right. I and then that. Pew 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 from Toronto were supposed to be on the first leg, but their visas got oh shit. Something at the last minute. We were playing with them in Toronto. Like, oh, these are the first three nights. We're gearing up. We're gonna go out. We're gonna be with you guys for the next six days or whatever, or six dates, I should say. Uh, and then the night of the second of three Toronto shows, they were like bad news. And then sure. how was the how was the process? Never you say they ran into some of those issues, but was the process smooth getting into the states to play, or how would you compare it to say you know three years ago if you'd go and do a states tour? Uh, it's we figured out probably six or seven years ago how to actually do it. You know, like and you just show the YouTube you the Letterman YouTube video. Is that what you do? Uh, it's. <laughs> <laughs> that has been useful in the past. Uh, but we, we toured the States so much that I think it's been a while since we got our, our, our act together to have it be smooth and easy. And we, I really sweat it a lot. I really stress a lot about it. And so consequently, it never goes badly because I'm always triple over prepared. Yeah. And this time was actually smoother than even usual. Um, and I, I, I don't know why in particular, if it was just... There's so many moving parts now that there's so many things they could ask about that instead they just ask about none of them. But it was so smooth, in fact, that we actually had to get our, like, this is boring, but we had to get, like, our visa lawyer to go to the, like, email customs and get retroactive, like, stamps, basically, for our passports because the guy that let us in just didn't even stamp our passports. Oh, my God. <laughs> like, it was it was that simple. We were at the border for, like, 14 seconds. Oh, wow. And then I emailed them all happy. Like, Don't worry. It was a great process. The guy didn't even ask about our visas. And they were like, uh, they didn't? That's actually a problem. Wow, that's so, wild. 
but it was all sorted out. I mean, honestly, part of it is experience. Part of it is just if you if you have a little bit of money, things yeah. go a lot smoother. Yeah. Like we just we just hired for a bunch of cash a law firm that specializes in getting visas for musicians. Mm -hmm. Lo and behold, we got our visas really smoothly. You know, that's that's all well and good if you have the money to throw around. But like, you know, if you're playing with no cash and you're still trying to make it happen, then it's not quite so smooth. You have to figure it out. That's the problem. I don't want to know about visas. Yeah. I'm not a lawyer. I play guitar. Not even well. <laughs> Were you guys taking tests every day? Not every day. Um, before the tour, we were like, and we'll buy a bazillion tests and we'll do them in the van. Obviously, we had to get tested before we went into the States. And then for the first half of the tour, I think we just got lulled into a false sense of security. Or I suppose it wasn't a false sense of security because nobody got sick. Um, and then the second half of the tour, we kind of like started doing tests. Not everybody every day, but yeah. somebody most days, just kind of keeping an eye on it. And, and it was completely fine. And we all were healthy and well as as it seems to continue here i bought some tests just to have at home yeah uh because you know you'll be at a restaurant and you get an email being like hey someone else at that restaurant that day was sick so now you have to like run around town panicking getting a test yeah it's like now i don't have to do that anymore i can just go into my drawer yeah we got some tests for the holidays which i'm very very grateful for yeah it, i mean they should just be sending out like in britain how everybody can get seven free tests every day they should just be piling them up at everyone's doorstep because ideally i would just be taking a test every morning yeah totally I mean, why not well know? and that seems to be it's i feel like you guys went on tour at a very good time because i i get the idea that in, in the last two weeks specifically and you've been back for three four weeks now three weeks now yeah um i've seen a lot of postponements and cancellations and opening acts dropping off bills yeah. uh mm -hmm. just in the last w week or two uh all all across the states it seems like uh i and, don't know and there are different restrictions getting put in place at borders obviously right. from various countries but it's starting to yeah kind of clamp down yeah bit, you know? we were actually kind of fortunate because when we went into the states it was before they even opened the border oh so we were allowed to cross because we were working right and there wasn't a bunch of other people there crossing for like shopping expeditions or vacation or whatever. Mm -hmm. So it was sort of us and the truckers just going through. And I think that that kept things pretty simple. Well, it sounds like a real good time. And uh, did you did you get to do anything with your new record or your new songs on this tour? I'm assuming not. But M my my own stuff. Yeah. No, no, no. no. Uh, I sort of purposefully I don't like to multitask on tour. Mm -hmm. Uh you know, I don't like to write on tour. The band has never been good at writing on tour other than Dave, who is like can't turn off that part of his brain. Yeah. Uh, I figured out the way that I figured out how to really maximize my enjoyment of tour was that I was like, I'm just on the tour when I'm on the tour. You know, I don't catch up on my podcasts. I don't catch up on Twitter. I just sort of sit in the van and like look around. It's crazy. That's it. And for me, that that's the best way to do it. So I was I was very happy. Just it was probably not the best business decision, but that's like that's half the reason I put the record out on my own. You know, was that I didn't want anybody emailing me being like, "Hey, what about the record?" Yeah, like, like did you for, for did better you even, or for worse? Did you take any any like do you have any physical copies that you were selling down there or? Nope, didn't I don't have any physical copies. Period. Wow, I don't, <laughs> that's too much money. <laughs> yeah, no, that's fair. Um, I, I've been listening. I know Pete's been listening to it a lot lately too. But uh, your your album's really good, man. Hot, hot damn! I appreciate it. Hot damn! Yeah, I'm. Uh, I'm feeling now back from tour a little bit remiss because I'm really proud of it. Uh, I really, Should really, be. really am happy with how it turned out. It's exactly what I wanted. You know, whether whether it's great or good or fine or bad, mm -hmm. it's exactly what I was trying. I knew what I was trying to do, which is kind of a novelty for me. I don't I from the get go. Say, no, but it came together. I took enough time with it that it coalesced and I began to understand what I wanted. Right. And then in the execution, that became clearer. And when it was finished, I had done it. You know, I had sort of achieved whatever ends I was aiming for. Well, bef before we get into specifics on songs, okay. just overall, what, what's the ratio between fictitious stories on this album and stories that are actually your own personal stories? Well, it's always a gradient. You know, I think that any specific is probably fictionalized. I know what he's getting at, Graham. If you reduce it to the common denominator, it, it ends up being <laughs> uh, being accurate, being true. <laughs> he desperately wants you to say that John Lennon wasn't actually a jerk. <laughs> no. no. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> but John, have you guys watched the Get Back? I haven't, but I've been hearing uh, lots about it. Yeah. I'm a big fan, and I agree. John Lennon was an asshole. John Lennon but, was criti- He had to be. I mean, the and I mean, I John Lennon is like a, a god. You know, I have no uh, no compunctions about John Lennon being great and key to his greatness. W- like the way in which he was great is that he was an asshole. The same way that Paul McCartney is like a big sweetie sweetheart lunatic. And that was like the key to their partnership and the key to their dissonance. And, you know, I think the Beatles embodied their archetypes and kind of created those archetypes really so thoroughly that it was vital to the entire thing. You know, you can't have a Beatles where John Lennon is a, a, as sweet as Paul. Yeah. It wouldn't I, work or where they're both jerks. I think it's important to say, and, and maybe I'm wrong and maybe I'm off base. I mean, I don't think you guys are going to disagree with me here. It, John Lennon was not a great dude. There's definitely lots of, Vi- like if a, you if he existed character, right now, sure. he would probably be canceled. Um, there's a lot of violence, <laughs> a little homophobia in there, maybe. But that's kind of the key to the John Lennon like overarching thing, especially if you go through the solo stuff. Yeah. And I mean, you know, people can decide whether I, you know, whatever. I like music too much. I'm maybe that makes me a bad person. That I'm like I'm not. I'm, I don't. I can't. I don't see any utility in writing off a man who's been dead for forty years. Yeah. Uh, for better or for worse. Uh, maybe that makes me part of the problem, in which case I guess I am. But he was trying to reconcile that. And I but feel like John Lennon, more than most people, was yeah. aware on yeah. some level, even if it was ultimately a narcissistic level, of his failings and of his limitations as a human being. And he was wrestling with those things yeah. if you look, for his he entire was, life through his art. He was pretty transparent in his later years about, you know, yeah, and maybe I shouldn't you, hit, hit that woman. And if you look at the end of, yeah. of, of repairing the relationship with Julian as they were just, you know, kind of building mm-hmm. a relationship right towards the end there as well. And Yeah. And I mean, the world is full of shitty people and also everyone has a little bit of shittiness within them. And so I think that, you know, I think that having artists who reckon with that in an honest way has value still and continues to have value. Well, uh, yeah. Because you can't, like, you can't purify the arts because you can't purify yourself or anyone you know mm-hmm. we're, we're inherently full of of contradictions and messiness and I, I don't think anyone can look back at their life and say that they were perfect and so to see people in public reckon with that and care to reckon with it yeah and be honest with themselves i think is you know there that's teachable it's an important which is step not, in... art doesn't need to be teachable but it can be and it's funny you mentioned those contradictions and john was full of them right because you did have that asshole side but you did have the make love not war and the whole peace movement and spreading love and... which was all it's all seemed to be part of his his reckoning Reckon, of, yeah. uh, of and 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 i think it's especially now and over the last few days and i think that it's a conversation that may kind of be pushed aside for the last couple of years, but that whole the the concept of forgiveness and and trying to um, fix fix issues and and uh, controversies of the past, like I don't think enough people are uh, realizing that that's a certain aspect that's going to have to be adjusted and recognized in in the coming years. So right. I don't yeah. know. I, I, and I, think, I don't know. I don't think the world's there we're, yet. We're, we're, yeah, we're rotten at forgiveness too, which yeah. is another flaw that most of us are possessed of. Yeah, that's a great great but point. That's I mean one of the things that I was sort of lightly thinking about while I was working on my record and just more in general was just like the as I feel like you know what is my my task what is my role as like a creator if I if I have one and ultimately what I just kept coming back to is like my role is to write the songs uh honestly and sometimes I'm really thinking about what they're about and other times I'm doing it by accident but you know you try you that's what art is and can be you put you put something out there that is the most honest thing that you can make mm-hmm. and then you have to trust the work to do what it will or won't do and, you know sometimes you nail it and sometimes you blow it completely but that you just have to leave space for yourself to do that because i think getting i can't like especially with fucking with songs trying to put some kind of moral or message in a song is something that i i find personally st- makes me break out in hives it's so distasteful to me and some people can pull it off but even like i was listening in the van we were listening to the uh not the most recent but the last idols record yeah and um and he just says it you know there's no subtext in those songs he just is like consent yeah i was like huh (laughs) 
I, that is interesting to hear someone do it like that because I would never even think to do it like that. And if like Dave brought in a song like that, I'd be like, can we maybe take a second pass of the lyrics and try to right. add some subtlety here? Yeah. But also, it's kind of cool to hear someone just scream the theme in your ears, you know? Yeah, that's and that's uh, a that's a I think that's a great example of a band too who've been doing that consistently until really until this last record that dropped a right. month or two ago is yeah. kind of the first time they didn't really have songs. Like one of my I have a one of my favorite idols lines is uh the best way to scare a Tory is to read and get rich. Yes, yeah. Which is, you know, if you want to fuck with conservatives then get knowledgeable <laughs> and make a ton of money. <laughs> that's such a good uh like that's such like a neoliberal angle too though where it's like the best way to fuck with tories coincidentally happens to be to become a tory yeah 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 That'll at show least halfway them. at least halfway you yeah. know um uh yeah there's definitely you could definitely pick apart the, well the i'll tear. tell you i do a lot of reading so that's that's half the battle you're almost there man um <laughs> well i'm i'm very interested to hear that you say that you were very happy with this album the album by the way the cost of doing business that is a very funny way to start a question. I was surprised to hear you say that you were happy. I didn't happy say with surprised. I said interested. Because... That, was, that was really, you think it's good. Uh, tell me more about that. I just, there's something about this record, and I, I actually, and I'm not lying, I had this feeling before I'd, I was reading an interview of yours where you had kind of talked about, um, you know, something that I feel that I think the same way is, creating something and then just having a lot of anxiety about actually putting it out there and, and making it public mm -hmm. uh, and how that can delay the process forever oh, yeah. if you want it to. Um, but I don't know. When I was listening to this record, I just really felt like uh, there was a level of perfection that I felt that you had achieved. And I, I, could, I, could, I felt like I could sense that you, you knew that you had achieved exactly what you wanted. Well, that's kind of the... Um the flip side of it because yeah it took me you know it took me so long obviously to make another solo record i, I did long time. material record yeah i've done other stuff but so and part of me needed to let go of that in order to get this record out there but then of course i look at this record versus all the other records i might have made had i got a little farther mm -hmm. and it's like oh well this one is much 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 better than those you know it, it kind of needed the weight and i hope that that weight won't repeat itself you know i would hate to do that again it was it was rough or uh it wasn't rough it was too easy was the problem you know, oh. i think if i'd been having angst about not releasing anything i would have released something yeah right? but instead it just kind of got away from me and i just didn't care you know i wasn't interested in doing it for a lot of that time mm -hmm. uh and the few times that i started to get excited oh maybe i'm on a track here it would burn out too quickly you know i wouldn't be able to maintain the excitement for it and I think that's because I was always trying to do something uh, like genre-y, you know, like, ooh, I'm really excited about synthy music right now. So I'm writing a bunch of synthy songs. But then I hear a record that has guitars on it and I kind of burn out on that. And like that work, like Girlfriend Material is is very explicitly a genre exercise, you know, and, mm -hmm. and that was kind of an end run for me. And that was how I got back into writing songs. But the difference between songs for that band and songs for my solo thing kind of ended up being like, there's songs that I'm writing on purpose to be away, and there's songs that I'm just writing. Yeah. And they're just whatever's coming out, and that kind of was the pile that started the solo record thing again. You, you, I just had songs that were like, well, I don't know, I just wrote it. You, uh, you actually I haven't done this in a while, but I went back and listened to, I don't know if you remember this, but you and I talked, you and Josh came into the radio station, uh, I think it was 2018, that sounds right. Before your show at Bose. And you had kind of mentioned that about that that uh, TPC record is that um, you'd gone into those recording and writing sessions very nonchalant and just like, and you thought you were bringing forth better ideas because of how um, oh, absolutely. strategically you were approaching everything. Yeah, I really, it's, I'm, I'm a thinky person. I'm a planny person. I tend to try and create to an end or mm -hmm. that's how I like to do it. You know, I'm always imagining like, okay, these are going to go in this box. I'm writing for this album or for this project. And even though ultimately that's how I did this record too, a lot of the songs at first were just kind of floating around. Yeah. Uh, and that, again, I kind of had to stumble into it a bit, even though I wound up in a similar place to maybe where I was before. There was some, I mean, this is all tricky internal creative stuff that from you know 
is hard to describe and from the outside probably looks all the same, you know, because ultimately you're just sitting down with a guitar and writing songs. But it's funny, I was just, uh, I went to see the uh, French Dispatch last night, the Mel yeah. Sanderson movie, and I was reading, you know, some behind the scenes stuff about it today. And they had, obviously, they had a professional artist come in to do all the paint, the paintings that Benicio del Toro uh, purportedly paints in his segment. And there's one painting that's kind of like the key to that whole section of the film. And the artist who painted it was saying, you know, I really didn't think it was there when we st- in the schedule change. So they had to shoot with the, the version of the painting that I had most recently done. And I, d- I didn't think it was ready. And so Wes said to me, listen, if you paint a better one, I can digitally insert that into the film. You know, we can use modern studio wizardry. And then he said he's, you know, he spent the year painting iteration after iteration after iteration of it. Uh, and he said, you know, we ended up, none of them were better. And it's not that I painted a better one. It's that my perspective on the one that was in the movie changed. And I found a way of looking at it that made me realize it was right. And that's kind of how it works with creativity, I find. is Sometimes it's like, it's not about the thing changing. It's about you just like, like doing a magic eye or something. You just suddenly, you see it in a, from a different angle. You catch a glimpse of it in a different light and you get it. It's like a, a bolt from the heavens. Yeah. Even though it's something you made yourself and like worked on ad infinitum, it can still, and I mean, it can take years. You know, I, I was recently, semi-recently listening to the um, covers thing that Tokyo Police Club did, the 10 by 10 by 10 yeah. that we did after Champ. And I, I, you know, I never thought it was bad. I had fun doing it. I always kind of thought it was a bit of a trifle, like kind of a, uh, you know, a, a publicity stunt, to put it cynically. And then I was just, I just happened to throw it on. I don't, for no particular reason, I was just curious. And just whatever it was about that moment, about how much time had passed, I was like, oh, I hear it now. I hear it as like something, like a part of what we did, a part of our body of work. Yeah. Contextualized. And it's, uh, and it was incredible, and it was really rewarding to hear it that way. And I was hearing things I'd never heard before. And, uh, you know, that's, that's how it often works. And you have to have patience and faith, frankly, that you will find your way to stuff. And, and once you've got there, now that you have that feel, we, do you think your feelings will ever change on that again? Do you think you'll go back to the way that you felt about it previous, or are you locked in now? I mean, I hope that I stay in this zone for a while just because it's fun. But I have to assume that I'll continue to think of things differently i'd like to just th- appreciate things more and more as time passes but you know maybe there's a bounce back to to come who's to say but he's seen the light now yeah and it's a whole <laughs> lot better than the opposite direction amen <laughs> um well yeah i mean we can go on and on about how much we enjoyed this record i'm um, actually i do want to bring free. one song up if i can because it wasn't the john lennon reference that i was alluding Bullshit. to with the fiction it wasn't Bullshit. i knew that was going to come up at some point uh <laughs> but how fictional or non-fictional is bridget yeah fuck simon uh that's a perfect example of one that's it's completely fictional you know i sat down and i made it up uh but also i was trying to relate true feelings that you know that touched experiences i've had and synthesized experiences i've had and emotions i've had you know that sort of take because it's kind of about like i mean you know in a way that the whole album is subtextually in part and this is this is the kind of boring shit that you write about when you're in your 30s but it's like oh you start to realize that the past is behind you and that you know time is finite and all those cliches uh, but it is when you realize it for yourself, when you when you sort of s- understand the truth of something rather than just know it, it can be quite profound. And so there's that feeling of like, what's past is past and not every door, you know, some doors that you didn't go through, you can't retrace your steps and go through them later. Yeah. You know, the, I mean, it's the road not taken. Like people have been writing about this since forever. Uh, and that's really, you know, it's 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 about that ultimately. Uh, but there's no, you know, even though some of the songs on the record, like um, Bargain at Twice the Price or whatever, are ex- or Hot Damn, are explicitly diaristic. You know, there's no, there's nothing between what I'm trying to say and what I'm saying. Right. But Bridget, it was like, this is too big to, the, I, I'm, I'm not skilled enough to say that directly in a way that feels artful or entertaining. Uh, it's also one of the first songs, it is the first song I wrote. Oh, wow. Okay. Uh, that, that's, it's the oldest song on the record. And then flashes is the sort of the other one that's old. And those are the two like story songs on the record. 
And I was writing a lot of story songs for girlfriend material because I, you know, I was trying to do like the whole steady thing. And it was interesting to me how if you trace the songs in chronological order, they get less and less fictional and I get more and more direct in what I'm saying. And I think it's, it's just me figuring out how to do that. Right. How to be direct in a way that feels artful rather than, um, you know, ham handed. Mm -hmm. But but so, yeah, so Bridget is complete fiction that contains complete truths. Yeah, that's very interesting. I uh, I did I, I really appreciated the toward the conclusion of that song being this level of acceptance and uh, being okay with it that you don't often get to hear or see in those types of stories. Yeah, and I mean that's the record kind of is and I you know if I'd put it out four years ago it would probably be more of a of a temper tantrum, you know more of a raging against the dying of the light. Whereas, you know, the album itself and, and in, to the point where it ends with like sort of a eulogistic, mm -hmm. uh, you know, like will and testament song. There is I'm, and I'm look, I'm not that old, like I'm sure there will be more raging against the dying of the light to come. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure I have a midlife crisis in me yet. <laughs> but for at least where I was when I made the record, I had I came to some kind of plateau, some kind of conclusion. What about Tiny? Where, where do visuals uh, fit in with your creative process? Like I, I'm so interested in knowing i mean i wish i could know every every instant of how you wrote that song from beginning to end because me too you know i'm a sucker for explosions in the sky and i love nothing more as a teen when death cab would just go on these long beautiful sonic tangents um and that song like i don't know i i feel like our visuals a, an important aspect of of the process not consciously because that's i really don't have a visual imagination okay you know the one thing I, I can write songs and I can sing and, you know, I can write stories and stuff yeah, pr pretty good. I can like if you need me to act, I can have I can kind of get it there. Mm -hmm. I cannot draw at all. Right. Like I can barely draw a stick figure, you know, like I'm, I'm just completely garbage in visual stuff like that. Yeah. And so I don't think in those terms, uh, which can be frustrating. But. Tiny was one where I didn't know what I was writing about. I didn't know what the song was about, which I usually, I used to be like, I need to know, I need to find what the song is about so that I can write towards that, you know, mm -hmm. simple. And Tiny, I never really did. So I just kind of started doing the thing. I was like, you know, something that only rock and roll really has is that you can kind of just say a bunch of shit. And if it goes over the chords in a certain way, it's, it's infused with meaning. And it's like it's impressionistic, you know, to yeah. put it pretentiously. People will will hear emotions and they'll they'll pull their own directness out of it, you know, to the point where people will always come up to you and like. Spend, I'm obviously have more experience this with Tokyo, especially because I don't write the lyrics, so I don't know what the hell they're about half the time. Yeah, <laughs> and people will be like, "I love that that song is about X." Like they're they're one thousand percent confident that the song is explicitly about a thing that it just isn't about. Yeah, or wasn't it wasn't supposed to be about? It wasn't intended to be about. Uh, and so Tiny was another one where rather than getting direct, I sort of let myself just drift with it. Because I just had that one. I had You Look Tiny in My Arms. I just liked that lyric. That's where it started. I have, in my, like, I have a notes app on my phone with like lyrical snippets. Yeah. And that was just a lyrical snippet. And I liked it over the melody. And then I just kind of didn't. There's one on every record where you just don't finish the words. And I was in the studio and I was like, ah, okay, well, you don't need many words in these verses. They're pretty spread out. So yeah. I'll just say this and I'll say that. I do a lot of takes. I think a lot of singers do this where when I'm demoing out the song, I'll just sort of like, over top of it. And word, like syllabic sounds always come out of that. And you find some anchors that flow nicely over the melody. And then you just try and find words that resemble those syllables. And then you build the song around those. And Tiny was very much like just cramming it. Sorry, this is a, not a visual movie. <laughs> well, it is. It I'm is, miming. Yeah. This is the SAP. I'm miming, pulling things out of thin air and then trying to cram them together quizzically like some sort of Puzz 3D. Uh, and that's that's where it ended up. And it kind of ended up being sort of like, you know, a kid song, ultimately. Like not not a song for children, but a song about children. And, yeah. You know, that that. That was the closest thing to an angle I had. But even that was pretty, I had to trust the chorus words to do a lot of the heavy lifting 
for that. And from, from what I've heard from other people, it worked quite nicely. So I'm, I'm grateful for that. And then I let, like I demoed it and it was like, you know, 90 seconds long. And I just had the, cause all those guitar, like the, all the guitar layers that come in oh, you, are that just loops. They're just dragged out loops in my logic that I was like, oh, that's really cool. Oh, that's really cool. Cause I'm just demoing it. I'm coming up with ideas. So I'm just tossing shit in. And then I accidentally left the loops going for too long at the end of the song. So they were just still there. And I was like, oh, that sounds kind of dope. I'm going to put like a chord under it. And then I left it and my buddy Brendan was over and I was playing him. He always wants to listen to my demos. I was playing him some. And I was like, yeah, this one, I kind of feel like I could just go on for like eight minutes. He was like, you should go on for 12 minutes. Do it. He's in yeah. metal bands. So he's really into every song being like 28 minutes long. Yeah, yeah. And so I just dragged it out. And we were in the studio and they're like, should the drums come in here? And I was like, wherever the drums should come in, eight more bars. Uh, and and I loved it. I want now. I want to make like an instrumental post rock record. Please do, man. <laughs> Please do. So that, the... fun to do that. And also, I'm so sick of writing lyrics. It's so hard. Yeah. Every song you have to write lyrics again it takes forever. Yeah, that's uh, so for listeners, and and I hope they'll go listen to the cost of doing business. But that song is six minutes and twenty four seconds, and I I agree with your yeah. buddy. It could have been twenty eight minutes. And like four and a half of those minutes are just. I wanted it to sound like the record was ending and people would get lulled into a false insecurity. It did. Like, oh, it's like a locked group. <laughs> you, you definitely achieved that. Definitely achieved that. Okay, good. Well, um, I'm so it's I'm so glad because you know people you don't ever you get you get emails from like Spotify and Apple Music being like here's how many people listen to your song ever and it's the numbers can be quite distressingly low. Yeah. And so just to hear any one person who actually that's what I was hoping people would experience. So I'm so grateful to you for paying attention and for telling me about it. As someone who has directed a movie before, which I would like to touch on shortly, but like, is there, do you, do you pay attention to, to movie soundtracks? Is that the, like that kind of sonic goal yeah, definitely. that you produced with Tiny, I, I think would be pretty suiting for, for a number of different scenes. Yeah, I, I listen to movie soundtracks a ton when I'm writing, like writing fiction or whatever, mm -hmm. um, which I did a ton of over the pandemic. Uh, Trying, trying to write books and stuff. Cool, man. That's, that's I, I can't write with lyrics on in no. the background. So yeah. I'll just find a bunch of movies that feel about like what I'm trying to write and I make a giant playlist and then just shuffle it up. Yeah. So consequently, my like stupid Spotify year end wrapped thing is always completely useless. Dude. It's like your number one artist this year was <laughs> Alexander Desplat. I, I or whatever. Had, I had a similar thing. I got my YouTube wrapped finally the other day. And I, I had a good idea of what I thought was going to be on there. And then I was like, oh, I forgot that I was doing university courses in the first half of the year. So exactly. there's just a fuck ton of Hans Zimmer and Boards of Canada and nothing. Yeah. nothing. God, I love fucking Hans, man. Hans the greatest, man. I, I, the, I was I was watching Dune for the second time in theaters. I saw it myself. I was yeah. like, I think Hans Zimmer is underrated. He is like the iconic composer of our generation. He has he, invented he, everything, basically, that movies sound like now. Can I say something? No, please. I think he's better than John Williams. Wow. I th he's working in a different milieu. John Williams is all about melodies. Yeah. And Hans is all about like t tone or texture or like mood. Yeah. I also think John Williams is a great composer for whatever the sound systems of the seventies were. Totally. Like Hans Zimmer is like, oh, you guys are watching this shit in IMAX. Yeah, yeah. I'm gonna make you feel it and to your the bones. Whole body is rattling. Yeah, and that's a wonderful thing. I really, really dig it. I think John Williams was score, a fantastic. Man. You know, he, yeah. Again, it's iconic, iconic, iconic uh, themes. But at the end of the day, I don't know. I think I'd, John I. John Williams also a huge biter. Every like the iconic John Williams score, you can trace back pretty directly to some like classical piece of music, like some, you know, 18th century Russian ballet. Interesting. You're like, okay, I mean, listen, I'm in a rock band. We're biters too. I'm not saying, <laughs> I think being a, being a biter is a noble thing. It is what music has always been. Uh, but, you know, I think, I don't know if John Williams loses points for that, but I think it's worth bringing into those conversations. Like, yes, the Harry Potter score is wonderful. It also is the Nutcracker. You know, it's funny, even with Hans and the Inception soundtrack, like he, I'm pretty sure how I remember is that he just built that entire soundtrack off of one, it's like that 1940s or 50s song. Yeah, they slowed down that uh, je, je ne regret rien, or I can't speak French, but yeah, and he, that Edith Piaf song that is in the movie diegetically. Yeah, totally. And then he was like, oh, that's cool. I'm going to make 
I'm going to make up what movies will now sound like for 30 years. <laughs> yeah, totally. Um, I And the Dune soundtrack is something that I have put on a couple times. I, I, I like it. I think that it does does kind of maybe need those visuals in, in certain mm-hmm. aspects. But like when I was doing those university courses in the spring, like I had the Dunkirk soundtrack on repeat. Oh, yeah. It's like nonsense. I'm, b- I'm a big Interstellar soundtrack guy. Yeah, that soundtrack's incredible. I think that's his best work, although I think the movie is. I like it, ultimately, but I, it, it's kind of not top Nolan. Yeah. You know what's really funny? Just listening to you guys talk about soundtracks and how you have them on so that you're not distracted, so that you can focus on what you're doing, but how well you know them all. So <laughs> right, is it still not distracting? Well, they I just mean, beam I'm just... into your brain. Yeah. And it, I Plus, think, when you see the movie, you're paying attention. Yeah, right? especially, and there's another one that unfortunately passed a couple of years ago, but uh, Johan Johan, yeah, and uh, yeah, great. He does this, the soundtrack for this movie called Sicario, and it's it like most people would not listen to that just on its own, but that's not for, relaxing. What's that? It's not relaxing. <laughs> no, it's not relaxing. But, but for some reason, I can put that on every few weeks and just like. I, yeah, you just feel it in all parts of your body. It's yeah, fucking crazy. That's why I listen to that shit. I'm really into the um, sort of one of his proteges, and I I don't even know how to begin to pronounce her name, but she did the music for like the Chern- Chernobyl. I think she did the Joker music. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which was uh, Hilda something. Hill. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Totally. That she she's the the clear heir to Johan Johansson. So there's still there's still nicely indic person out there making icy beautiful sounds. Well, even the guy that did the Inception soundtrack. Uh, who works with um, Donald oh, yeah, Glover yeah. all the um, time? Ludwig uh, Göransson or Gorenson. something. Yeah, like that. They, yeah, again, like you said, 20, 20 years ago, ten years ago, Hans Zimmer just kind of started building this groove that has become yeah. the zeitgeist for movie soundtracks. And and um, Ludwig Göransson did the Mandalorian music, which I think is so like secretly the best part of that show, where he managed to go into this like because there's already been you know like they had um. Michael Giacchino do music for, I think, Rogue One. There's been a couple of other composers who have tried to do the John Williams thing, Mm -hmm. and it always sounds, to my ears at least, so chintzy. Like, it always sounds like the Spaceballs music. (laughs) It's like a a goofy, where it's like, ba, 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 ba. Um, And I thought the Mandalorian music, which has, like, synthesizers and shit in it, managed to capture the spirit of the Star Wars thing so well while also expanding the sonic palette. I thought that was one of the most exciting things that he has done, the most exciting things that could have happened within that, like, total at this point, total, like, corporate property, like, husk of art. Uh, and also, it just rocks, man. Yeah, I, I haven't watched much of The Mandalorian, but that is one thing I remember from the first few episodes I'd seen was that kind of attempt to infuse this, like, old school, almost almost an NEO kind of vibe, light light NEO vibe into this this new Western Western kind of vibe. Yeah. It was it was a very successful synthesis, I just thought. Yeah, that's a good... Which the show wasn't always, you know? They didn't always nail it on screen, but I thought the music never missed. Um, okay, so... We are way off. What are we supposed to be talking about? <laughs> We're going to talk about your movie real quick, because okay. you, you did direct a movie... Uh, it did. In 2017 is when it came out, right? It's called Clean. In as much as it came out at all. <laughs> so that is my question. How the hell do we watch this thing? I don't know. And too much time has passed. It's a, That one's tricky. I, I bit off more than I could chew making that, not just in terms of how it's really hard to make a movie, but also I was so used to making music, which is either just me or me and like my three buddies. Mm-hmm. And so you can kind of like... You can you can be pretty um, careless with your with your art when it's music. You know you can write a lot of songs that don't come out. You can produce and like record, go all the way with songs, and then just like not feel right about them or like yeah. get rid of them. And we did the movie, and it was a really fun. Well, it was sometimes really fun, sometimes the hardest thing I've ever done. Process, uh, ultimately really rewarding, incredibly educational, but just like. I wasn't good enough for what I was trying to do. And so, especially now that, you know, so much time has passed, I look at it and I'm like, I, I see the goals. I see the moments we kind of got close to it, but there's so much to it that I just find really like frustratingly not there. Okay. That it's really hard for me to let it go enough to put it out there, which I mean, you know, 
that there's also just inertia where it's like we applied to film festivals and that takes a year and then you don't get into that. You apply yeah. to a second round that takes a year. You don't get into those. Now two and a half years have passed. Plus it took a year to edit the thing. So even before we talked about releasing it in any way, you're three years after you actually made it. Yeah. And so it's already kind of like artistically, it's like everyone's moved on from this. And then I'm kind of like embarrassed by it, frankly. Not that I don't think it's embarrassing, but as just like it's so me, it's so thoroughly like my thing. But then you're like, oh, but all these people worked on it, and all these people helped me, and all these people like took a lot of time out of their lives to to work on this. And it's just kind of sitting on a hard drive somewhere. And I don't know how to reconcile my unwillingness to release it with the fact that it makes me feel kind of like a jerk. And so far, the way I've reconciled it is by constantly kicking the can down the road, and it's working pretty good. Do you like? Do you think that your cast and crew feel that as strongly about it as you do, though? I was gonna say, do they mention it? Do they bring it up often? Like, hey, when are you gonna do something with this? No. And the people, like my friend Mike, who was kind of the producer and and, and cinematographer, and you know, everyone had eight thousand titles, as mm-hmm. you can imagine. Uh, he kind of took it in hand. He was kind of in charge of the because it's his studio that sort of. Uh, like bankrolled and gear provided the whole thing. So he kind of took it in hand for like getting out there and doing stuff with. And he was the one that really did all the work to set up the um, the screening that we had and all that. And him and I have talked about it a few times and we'll get close, you know, we'll be out having beers. And by the third beer, we're like, yeah, let's just go home right now and put it on Vimeo and just like throw the link up and then it's out there if anyone cares. And then just neither of us will do it. So that's the other thing. If someone probably came in and was like, hit me over the head about it, I would probably just do it. Yeah. But it seems like everyone is either content to let it lie or <laughs> is is so mad at me that they can't even bring it up. In 20, 20 years, maybe I'll be able to watch it on Criterion or something. Well, I'm getting a little bit horny to make movies again. Hell yeah. Which I thought I thought I wouldn't. I was like, this is, I can't do it like that again. Like self-funded, there's no money. So the way that you do it without money is to just like pour blood into it. Yeah. Like sleep for two hours a night kind of thing. I could barely do that when I was 28 or whatever. I, I don't think I could do it now. But I, you know, I always have idea, I have a billion ideas for like I said I was I was writing books during the pandemic and I've always got a million ideas. It's hard cuz we're not big enough that I can just get it for free. Yeah. Uh, you know. There are plenty of like if you're I'm trying to think like I don't know like if I bet if the guitar player from Billy Talent wrote a book, he could probably get it published. Mm-hmm. Uh and but the guitar player from Tokyo Police Club, not useful enough. No connections. <laughs> I tried. I hit up everyone. I was like, does anyone know anyone that could help me with this? And the answer across the board was like, nope, there's just no overlap between these industries. Really? Which, wow. fair enough. I was trying to do nepotism, you know, dick move. So I, I, it's good that I didn't get a freebie. But then you just have to go. It's been so long since I had to go into the, um, like the, the, the open market, such as it is. Yeah. Uh, very annoying. It sounds like it. I, I, I'm I kind of shocked to hear that. I feel like independent publishing right now would be huge. Huge. Yeah. But Yeah, you'd think. there's There are a bazillion books. Yeah, that's true. But I wrote, I wrote a kid's book, and kid's books are a little more um, gatekeepy because kids don't just go to the store or go on Amazon and buy books. Yeah. They have to be, their parents buy them, or the libra- their librarian at their school gets it or whatever. Yeah, you got to get Jimmy Fallon to And so to get into that it. world... Because that's the thing. People will be like, why don't you just self-publish it? Like, you can press a button on Amazon.com and you'll have published your book. Yeah. And I was like, yeah, and then literally my parents will buy it? Great. Yeah. I'll buy it. I can send I'll them the PDF. It, uh, I was like, it's got to be It's got to be real. It needs to be legit. It has to come through Scholastic or whoever. <laughs> it's a Scholastic <laughs> book fair. It's just Hell a yeah, high man. bar. Hell yeah. That's awesome. Uh, that's what I remember. Because they were the ones that had the book fairs when yeah. I was a kid. I don't know Those if those still things exist. were the greatest. Um. All right, so I'm not going to push you on clean. I hope to see it one day. I do. As as I'll I'll let you know if it ever trickles out there. Yeah, because it sounds like a fun project. Uh, the concept is great. It's about a what an evil Roomba. Is that how it goes? Yeah, it's a Roomba that sucks up the ashes of a murderer during like an electrical storm. Cool. And become becomes haunted. So I wish it was sillier. That's the thing. It was like a really silly idea that we were going to make silly. But then I was also really into Edgar Wright at the time, yeah, who, yeah. who I still am a fan of. Uh, and I like, I overwrote the script, and the script alone I think is like pretty good, but then necessitated more seriousness than we were really able to muster with like our limited resources. And the most limited resource was my skill as as a director. I just didn't I didn't know how to do it. Yeah, because um, it's that's just really really hard. Just something as simple as like you two guys sitting at that table having a conversation like how do you shoot that scene 
You know, Steven Soderbergh could knock that bad boy out in an afternoon, but I was like, I don't know. It doesn't feel right. And if we, that's not having a visual, visual imagination, I didn't know what I wanted. Yeah. And so it was also that thing where I'd be like, well, that's not quite right. That's not quite right, which is the most annoying way to be a collaborator is just to constantly be saying no. But I didn't know how else to get to where I wanted to get. Uh, so I think also just life experience, I would be better at that now. Yeah. You know, just being like an, an older, smarter person. Well, hopefully smarter. Or maybe just more aware of my own dumbness. <laughs> more well, humbled. It, it, a very impressive cast, too. I mean, do you follow Raina Doris on, on Instagram? No. Fuck, do you see the week she had? God damn. Oh, yeah. I'm in I'm in a group chat with her, and she's always going on about... I, I always know what's on the hopper. Holy for shit, World man. She, she had Neil Young on the show this week yeah. on NPR, Elton John, I think. And then there was like two other names that she had announced for the week that were it's crazy. I mean, she talks to everyone. Yeah, it's wild. You know, that's her. That's that's the show. Everyone goes to World Cafe. Yeah, it's very uh, cool. So, yeah, she's just knocking it out. Yeah, she's going to. I'm seeing her next weekend. I think she's going to be back in town. Cool. Uh, cool. We're really good friends. I'm a big Raina fan. Um, well, someday we'll see that. What's going on with Girlfriend? Uh, I, the next record is kind of written. Oh shit, no uh, way. I have all the songs, not all the lyrics are finished, but I, like before the pandemic, cause the guys, you know, back when it was still novelty, everyone thought it was gonna be two or three weeks and yeah. they just have to occupy themselves at home. The other guys, we have, a, we have an, right now, Girlfriend Material is a group chat. That's basically, it's, it's <laughs> primary utility is it's some, some way for the four of us to talk, uh, which is really, really nice. Uh, but the other three guys were like, are there new songs we could learn? Like throw us some songs. And they're always asking that. And, uh, you know, everyone else, like, they have kids and shit. So they're like, yeah, send us a new song to learn. And then three weeks later, they're like, I haven't listened to it yet. So I was like, oh, you guys want a new song to learn, huh? Smoke the whole pack, boys. And I sent them, like, 50 demos. And so to do that joke, I had to finish a bunch of demos. So I ended up, like, writing all the songs in the first week of the pandemic, sent them off. And then I was like, well, now I have to wait until we're all in a room and, like, that's tough because Josh lives in L.A. now. Oh, shit. Jake lives like out by Ottawa now. Joe is still in Toronto, but he has a kid. and He's super busy with work. And so the whole point of that band, the thing that makes it not a Graham Wright solo project is the other guys. Yeah. And I, like, I don't want to do it remotely. If we just start doing it remotely, it's going to turn into a solo thing. But to get everyone in the same room for any appreciable amount of time is now really difficult. Especially like Josh already has to come here to do Tokyo stuff. You know, does he really want to spend double the amount of time away from his family to do like girlfriend stuff that doesn't even pay? Uh, he says he does. He's always really enthused about it. <laughs> it's like, yeah, but then like look at the calendar when I ask you to add two weeks onto that trip and see how your wife feels. <laughs> yeah. So I really want I want to make the next record. I know how it should go. I know where I, I know what studio I want to do it at. I got it all planned out, but it's just like it's going to cost. It, I, we're going to pay for it, you know. We might get some money from the label. We might not. The last one certainly did not make their money back. So yeah. I would, would not be mad if the label was like, we're not throwing good money after bad. But yeah, I just, I'm kind of wait. I keep hoping it'll just naturally make sense. Cause I don't know what other way to do it. Like, I don't know. I don't want to be that, that hard. Like that. I don't want to wrangle everyone. Taskmaster. Exactly. It's not, it's not worth it. The point of the band is to, be fun yeah yeah and you guys and so made that be like okay we're booking clear. flights we're, we're doing two weeks everyone's got to be like tight on the song yeah it's like ugh, i'd rather just wait another like there's no time limit on this right. shit the music's like throwbacky it's not cutting edge Graham's so a monster. you know <laughs> we'll make it when we make it <laughs> um well i uh we're, we're gonna probably wrap this up pretty shortly but um going I back mean, I, i'll talk all day long so you guys gotta stop well me. i wish we could but um I went back to that interview we had in 2018, and I had brought up an article that the Red Deer Advocate had published mm -hmm. about Tokyo Police Club coming back to Red Deer. Do you remember the headline? I don't. It was back from the brink. Oh, yeah. And it was because you guys were so dangerously close to blowing up. And it was like, it was kind of funny because the article itself wasn't too doom, but just the back from the brink headline is is very loaded and you would you when i asked you about it you guys kind of established that it wasn't actually that serious and you said and i quote bands you know bands that go brink or there are bands that go brinkier than that on a daily basis which i <laughs> that's love a, that was a that's a very funny thing to have said yes. i love that bring that for me i, I love that brinkier. That's, I, i'm gonna try to adopt that term wherever i can now uh 
that is true. The Tokyo Police Club version of the Brink is like very <laughs> polite and cheerful. He's very level headed and friendly. But that's what happens. That's the that's the like you have to have a bio for every record. You know, you have to have a thing that you send out to yeah. everybody. I'm sure you know this being a radio station, you get a copy of it. And it's such a naked look at how like your soul and life and spirit are just like metabolized by the machine where you it's like okay this was like you know the brink was really a three-year process of everyone reckoning with what it meant to like be getting older and be collaborating and like changing their expectations and just like you know not that anyone should care but for the four of us that's like oh that's like the most profound collective and individual experience that we all went through it took ages like any important experience does and then you're like well now we need to like get that down to a snappy sound bite yeah and that snappy sound bite in the in the bio becomes like they almost broke up and then that gets turned into back from the brink and that's then you have to answer questions about it for two fucking years and then but there's no what's the alternative because the thing is we're not interesting narratively we make good songs we're just like four middle class white guys like yeah. no one gives a shit about our story nor should they uh but you can't just be like here's a new record listen to it if you're tame impala you can do that but if you're tokyo police club you need to give people a reason to care and that's tricky because we work on the songs really hard yeah that's usually the reason people should care so like the next record we do i don't know what the story is going to be I, and then like it's like and that's a kind of a problem unfortunately well fit brink here into I'm it somehow back from the brink again yeah yes brink here than ever <laughs> <laughs> um okay before we go Pete do you have do you have anything else well one question I've been dying out what are you drinking yeah what is that I just finished a Guinness oh, what, it was a Guinness okay I knew it was a stout. I had a, I I had a, a spare Guinness in my fridge and uh, I was like well it's only you know one in the afternoon but Guinness is a nice lunchtime beer that's true that was, was it and it's December time? I felt like you know we're gonna do a chat and have a beer um, well, uh, I, I'm, I'm curious, and I hate to move back to the movie soundtrack, but I'm curious. You, you obviously saw the French Dispatch. Or do you have a pick for 2021? Do you have a favorite flick? I haven't seen a lot of the important ones yet, I feel like. But started, I they're just starting to come out now, so that's fair. Yeah, I can't see a world in which I enjoy anything more than I've enjoyed Dune. Okay, yeah, yeah. Like, I get, I get, like, I don't know, who knows in 10 years if Dune's going to be Lord of the Rings or not, but it just felt like such a, like, while I was watching, particularly the first 30 minutes of that movie, in the moment, my brain was like, is this the greatest achievement in motion pictures? There is not a time? wasted second in that movie. No. It is. And it just fucked. uses everything. It has all of the technology brought to bear, but it doesn't look like, I love, I think I like CGI now. I think they finally got it to a place not everybody, you know, I don't know if the CGI in like Eternals is any good. I certainly won't be seeing it. But like I saw Godzilla versus Kong mm. earlier this year. I was like, oh, damn, that monkey looks wicked. And it's it cool. doesn't look real. They're not trying to make it look real as much anymore. They're trying to make it look a little like animated, it's right. really stylistic. Mm -hmm. And all the, I don't know how much of the ships in Dune are miniatures versus how much are CGI or it's, what. It's hard to tell. That's shit he did Exa with the sand. Exactly. Man, the sand when it was like crashing against the rocks, like actual yeah. waves. Yeah. How the fuck do you do what that? What the hell? And that it's just, crazy. and I saw it on IMAX both times. So it's just like you can't even look at all of it at once. It's like larger than your field of vision by several orders of magnitude. The music is just like your brain is vibrating. Yeah. I, man, that's my shit. No, that's what we go to the theaters for. Th thank God for Denis But I, the Matrix might be better, actually. Right. I think I'm more hyped for the new Matrix movie than I have been for any movie in a long time. That's pretty cool. Just it's the trailer for the Matrix is my favorite movie of the year, actually. That's uh yeah that's uh that trailer's pretty cool. I'm excited. I'm looking forward it's to it. You a Matrix guy? Pete? Not at all. No. No. I not a Keanu. I can't. Oh yeah, you're a yeah. Keanu, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Sorry. That's, that's fine. Just, apologize to yourself, Mike. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> More Keanu for the rest of us. <laughs> um well Graham, Trauma's it was uh, a real pleasure to talk to you, man. Thank you so much for making the time. Yeah, this was great. We did not talk about uh, much about the road or the stage. That's true. But <laughs> yeah, that's true. Uh, I, I did I actually. I do have a, a couple road stage related questions, but we'll save it for Graham Wright Part Two. Yeah, man. Brinkier. Uh, anytime you guys want. Uh, this was such a such a blast. Yeah. Next amazing. time you are in town, we would really love to show you the space here. It's pretty cool, and I think you. I like need to just, I think I just need to come out to Red Deer and have like a four day hang. Just yeah. Come. Why not? Oh yeah. I bet flights are cheap. 
In Cam- you yeah. fly to Calgary, I guess. Yeah, maybe fl- fly to Calgary, or you could do a flare out of Hamilton, probably, yeah. or Billy Bishop, or something. Those are I. I live closer to the Pearson than either of those. I'm oh, do you actually? Toronto, so. <laughs> Um, yeah, getting to this, getting to Billy Bishop is a huge pain for me. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, yeah, I, I bet it sounds. Uh, I've never actually been used Billy Bishop before, but it doesn't seem like the easiest thing. It's great if you're like a business traveler. Yeah, we we use it a couple times. We had band gear, and it's like, oh, like the elevator's too small. There's like big <laughs> heavy lips everywhere. The trolleys, stuff's falling everywhere. It's like not designed for that. It's another world over there, man. On that that it's weird world over island. there. It's just guys in suits with briefcases looking at you like you're a lunatic. Well, um, yeah, again, real pleasure, and, and we'd love to have you on again sometime. Uh, yeah, anytime. Say the word. Cheers, man. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank have, you. Have a great uh, end uh, of your year. Yeah, you too. Thanks so much. Happy holidays to, to you and to all the listeners and to everyone at Bose, the whole Bose family. I can't wait to be back. Well, yeah, us too, man. All right. All right. Peace, brother. Take care, boys. Later on. Bye. Hot damn. Hot damn. Track two. Basically, what I get out of that is I need to watch Dune because I haven't yet. I've heard no like, interest or I, I think some of the early things I heard about it was it wasn't good. So I think I, for whatever reason, and I have this perception in my mind that it, it's it's not good. Well, I think it's a weird thing where you've got people who are fans of the book and then people who are fans of the Lynch Dune and the idea of the Jodorowsky. I don't actually, I haven't seen either of those or, or the Lynch one anyways. I think I've seen bits and pieces. It looks goofy as hell. Yeah. So I think that there's a lot of expectations, but at the end of the day, Denis Villeneuve has done no wrong yet making any movie. And he's the one that redid, did the Blade Runner sequel. Right. It's fucking killer. So yeah, I don't know. It's, um, I really enjoyed it having no context of the Dune universe or the lore. Yep. When I say there is not a second wasted, I saw it with a coworker of ours. And as soon as the movie finished, he was just like, wow, that was a lot of lore. Like a lot. And that's because not a second of that two and a half. But if you don't hours, know the lore, yeah, it's you're fine. It was totally fine. I understood huh. everything. Okay. And it's a really cool story. So anyways, I would recommend it. I, I thought it was great. Yep, I'll do that this weekend for sure. Um, yeah. Uh, anyways, that was Graham Wright, and that was fantastic. In between listens of that album, because that album is really, really good. A yeah, complete yeah. gem. Yeah. A complete gem. Yeah. It's uh, don't don't hesitate on that. Graham Wright's the cost of doing business. I love it. He just seems very comfortable with everything, right? Like he knows where Tokyo Police Club sits in the hierarchy of things. He knows that you know he's a subtle writer and not a direct writer. Like it, yeah, for a band. For Tokyo Police Club, who I've always found them kind of fascinating because their rise was at a very interesting time in music, right? Mm-hmm. Like they were a true indie band when yeah. we used to, when that was what the genre was called before, at least in Canada, radio terms, it just became alternative, right? Yeah. Um, and they had some insane success. Um, but yeah, to hear his thoughts on it and how he processes and works towards his own solo and side projects, yeah, he's a smart dude. And to that, uh, like uh, you'd kind of brought up, how you just you don't you don't take no for an answer. You don't look at uh, I forget what exactly what the word was that you guys had used, but you're gonna go out. You're gonna do your thing. Yeah, yeah. Regardless yeah. of you, you're not scared of failure. You're not. Yeah. You're just gonna go out and do it. Yeah. And that's exactly what they've done. So again, to go and tour the U.S. just a month, month and a half ago to some awesome fans. To some awesome fans. Yeah. Yeah. No, I'm happy for them, and it was a pleasure talking to Graham again, and you, Peter. Always it's nice seeing you. Always a pleasure. Here in the communal creative studios, producers Ryan and Riley sitting around listening to, listening to us and, I don't know, watching us maybe. I think they're doing other things, to be honest. I'm pretty sure that... Uh, Ryan's working on his other 30 projects. Yeah. Both of them together. I think Riley was reading a book or something back there. Busy, busy guys. Huge shout out to Sawback Brewing Company, uh, Go Services Inc., Tourism Red Deer, and Bose Barn Stage for helping bring this together as well. It's weird, man. People really like Bose. You know, and it's we mentioned that we we're going to talk about the uh, uh, Christmas decorations, right? <laughs> yeah, like yeah. what I've got on the front of my house is nothing compared to what happened inside at Bose. Follow yeah. Bose on social media. Go to their Instagram and take a look. Yeah, at what they did to uh, kind of transform it into a winter wonderland. It's crazy. Yeah, it's pretty wild shit. They, uh, yeah, it was. Uh, I was there for a few hours of the setup of that, and it was. I don't think I've ever seen anything like it. Actually, it was madness, but it worked out. The results were fantastic. All right, uh, follow the road, the stage on uh, social medias, and please, God, 
If you get me anything for Christmas, subscribe to the Communal Creative Studios YouTube channel, which you can see and find a it link to in the description. Cheapest, easiest gift you can give. Cheapest. Is it even can you even say cheapest when it's totally the free? The freest. The freest. I don't need anything for Christmas. Just subscribe to the damn YouTube channel. Brinkier and freest. Yes. I can't wait for us to be able to use the word brinkier <laughs> in our evolution of the road the stage. Um, when are we back? All through the like there's no holiday stopping here. Fuck no. Fuck Christmas. We're working yeah, straight sure, through. Sure. All right. So what, what does that mean, Pete? I think it's every Wednesday. 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 The Road the Stage is produced by Ryan Cooley and Riley Sir Yin at the Communal Creative Studios in Red Deer, Alberta. In partnership with Go Services Inc., Sawback Brewing Co., Tourism Red Deer, and Bose Bar and Stage.